every session, no matter where I am in the globe, the results are the same. The questions the church is attending to are not the questions that will most shape the world. And even more, every time at every poll, participants recognize that the questions that are shaping the world most are the exact questions that they believe the church is least prepared to participate in. So really, it's, it's, it's really imperative that every leader and organization takes a moment and looks up, takes this intentional effort and build and begins to attend to our dynamic world. Welcome to the Lausanne Movement Podcast, where we have a passion to accelerate global mission together. If you like today's episode, won't you take a moment to rate and review our podcast and subscribe? That way you won't miss a thing. And now, for today's interview. Dr. Nieman, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you with us. Thank you, Jason. appreciate it. My pleasure being on today. Uh, I've personally really been looking forward to our interview today. I've often caught myself geeking out on research studies from organizations like Barna. And when I first heard about the State of the Great Commission report, I couldn't help but get excited about its potential. But before we dive into the State of the Great Commission report, I would love to give you an opportunity just to share with our audience a bit of your story and a bit of your background. When I first met you, I just assumed because of your role with the State of the Great Commission reports that you were a researcher or missiologist. But I was pleasantly surprised to hear that you were first and foremost a professor of architectural design. And I found it so inspiring that part of your story is this integration of passion and gifting and a love for the church and for mission. And so I would love for you to just share a bit of your story. How did you, as a professor of architectural design, get involved with a global missions organization like Lisan? And how did you become involved in directing the State of the Great Commission reports? Yeah, thank you, Jason. Well, I'll have to say this has been a bit of a long road, but a road that the Lord has been faithful to. As you mentioned, my primary occupation or my primary discipline is design. Early in my career, though, Jason, I lived a very different life. I lived one Sunday at church and Monday through Friday in the design studio. Early in my career as a professor of architecture, I found that what I was teaching, the design philosophies I was espousing were very divorced from what I was learning on Sunday. And the Lord was very faithful in this process as I began this long, multi-year process of stitching my life together of faith and profession. Through this, I had the wonderful opportunity to pursue lots of other graduate education, graduate education in apologetics, master's of theology, a THM in missiology. I often say that I had the opportunity to deconstruct my worldview, reconstruct a biblical worldview, and then find a missional calling through it all. And in that moment, and in those times, I thought this was leading actually to a vocation as a full-time pastor or a missions pastor or missions organization leader. And, but through it all, God continued to call me back to design and back to design and found that there was a great, uh, great need in design to understand what Christianity has in there. Through my education, though, that's what I got involved in was on. When I was at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary pursuing my THM in missiology, I, got, I started working with Doug Birdsall in the Lausanne movement. I've actually now been on staff at Lausanne for 13 years, one of the longer staff members in Lausanne. and have held lots of different roles from research director to insights to operations, all the way now to this point with my cumulative experience in both design and missiology, but also my experience in Lausanne to now be the director of the State of the Great Commission Report. Well, thanks for sharing that, Matt. And what advice would you give to, to those in the workplace, those who are workplace leaders aiming to, to integrate, just as you did, your, their passion and their gifting that God has given them with mission or the local church? Yeah, it was an interesting process that, that I went through, a very intentional process. I've learned a lot over the years. At the beginning, I really believed that to be Christian as a designer or in my workplace, I would simply just had to apply Christian behaviors, if you will to that setting. So I would be the nicest guy in the room. Or as I moved all the way, I said, well, I need to be more of a witness to Christ. And so I would leave gospel tracts in the bathroom or I'd evangelize at work. But I recognize as I continue to study more and think about this deeper, that there were a deeper thread of what it means to be a Christian designer. It wasn't simply being a nice guy or simply evangelizing at work. I had to do the hard work and ask those fundamental questions of the faith to my profession. What is the purpose of design? 
what is good design? What is the role of design? What does it mean to be an agent of reconciliation as a designer? These Christian theologies, mm -hmm. how does it reframe and rescope my actual profession and then make me and allow me to pursue my profession completely differently? It was at that level of faith integration that I finally felt like I had a fully integrated and I was acting as a Christian. So my encouragement would be simply don't leave it at the surface level. Don't leave it at prayer or evangelization or being nice. All these things, those things are good and you should do those. But ask the deep questions of purpose, meaning, intent within the Christian faith of the profession. Wow, I can't help but wonder how beautiful and powerful the local and global church would be if every single one of us, regardless of our profession, would ask those integrative personal questions of purpose and meaning behind what we do each day. I think God would be honored through, through that process. And I think the mission of God would be accelerated through it. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Nieman. Let, why don't we jump into today's yeah, conversation, great. which is all about the state of the Great Commission Report. To begin, could you just give us a brief explanation of what the state of the Great Commission Report is? We're going to dive into the details of it as we go a little bit further. But more specifically, could you share the vision and the heart behind the commissioning behind the state of the Great Commission? Yeah. Really, the heart of the Lausanne movement is to accelerate global mission together. And we do this through connecting influencers and ideas for global mission. Lausanne is really at this, this exciting time. As many people know, since 2019, the Lausanne movement has been engaged in a multi-year global polycentric process, what we call Lausanne 4, L4. And the objective of L4 is to really catalyze collaboration of the global church towards the discipling of the nations and the shaping of the world. But any successful collaborative action really has to have the foundation of knowledge. A key part of catalyzing collaboration towards this intentional, strategic Great Commission effort is really knowing the current status of the Great Commission and the dynamics of our ever-changing world. So really with this collaboration in mind and action in mind, Lausanne is producing this State of the Great Commission report. This report's really bringing together the best global data and key strategic thinkers to understand really where the greatest gaps are and where the fundamental opportunities are for the Great Commission's fulfillment. So this is the vision of the State of the Great Commission Report, to prepare us for collaborative action and to do it strategically. Wow, that's so cool. And we're going to dive into the details of all of that right now. But before we go there, I would love to hear what motivated you to take a leading role in this project. Yeah, Jason, I could, I'll be honest here. When I was first approached to serve as a director of the State of the Great Commission Report, I was really quite hesitant at first. As you can imagine, this is a really daunting task to attempt to produce a mm -hmm. report that documents not only the current State of the Great Commission, but future trends and trajectories between now and 2050. As I sat around, I was like, wow, is this even possible? Can I do this well? But really, I began to reflect back on my own leadership roles in various Christian organizations. And I remember just how important strategic broad scope information was for me at those times. There have been many times in my leadership where I was just really busy tending to the day-to-day -day organizational mission, mm -hmm. moving from email to meeting to email to event. And these were really good activities and really important activities, but really, and they produced results. They were really well-intentioned and they seemed to make immediate progress. But as I come to learn throughout the years, it's what I would call head down progress. But there was times where the Lord really came to my side and provided either a conversation over coffee or a forwarded article. And it gave me this moment to lift my head up and see the times around me. It was really on those times that I was spurred to, to make unexpected moves. It was disruptive at times, but those were the times really where my organizations and my efforts found deep fruit within them. So really, these moments of strategically looking up, seeing the forest instead of just the trees, caused deep disruption, as I said, but really strategic and fruitful work. So I'm sure a lot of our listeners here and a lot of great leaders have had similar experiences. Most leaders carry out day-to-day -day tasks of the mission and don't have really the time to gather data in a curated or comprehensive way. So they want to be strategic, but they just don't have those immediate tools to do so. When I was thinking and contemplating this role, that really was the crux of my ultimate decision. As daunting as it was, it is motivating to provide busy global leaders the tools that they need to respond to God's Great Commission in a broad strategic way. So I often view the State of the Great Commission as a gift from Lausanne to these leaders, providing them a moment to look up 
from the email box and see where God is moving and where God is needed. So ultimately, I feel honored to serve as a State of the Great Commission Director, uh, working with the best researchers around the world to curate this really comprehensive document so that leaders can take a moment and lift their head up and serve God well. Wow. Thank you for that, Dr. Newman. As you were speaking, I was just reminded of the interview I had with Michael O a few episodes ago on this podcast and how he, he spoke about his interactions with um, CEOs and, and leaders of missions organizations. And he, he ref, as he was reflecting on his interactions with them, he had asked them, you know, how, how is the state of the Great Commission going? And a lot of those leaders could tell you how they were doing yeah. in their mission, in their ministries, but they didn't have reliable data to connect them to the global picture, to a, a missional picture of actually what is happening with the state of the Great Commission. And um, as I think about that, you know, this, this report isn't necessarily the first report to try and attempt to answer the question of how are we doing when it comes to, to global mission and how, what, is, what does the state of the Great Commission actually look like? And I would love to hear from you. How does this report build upon or differ to previous reports or studies that attempted to tackle the question of the state of the Great Commission? Yeah. Really, the state of this great, this Lausanne State of the Great Commission report stands on the shoulders of so many wonderful men and women researchers around the world. You know, the State of the Great Commission report doesn't really supersede or replace any of the important findings that these researchers have published throughout these years. Uh, it really begins to bring them together and curate them. But I do believe that there are really three unique things that this report brings. First, I think the uni uniqueness of the State of the Great Commission report is really in its comprehensiveness. As we said before, a lot, of, a lot of leaders see their particular slice, but don't get to see the entire scope. So the State of the Great Commission report brings together really the best research findings from across a wide variety of correlated factors and presents in a manner that's appropriate for church and marketplace leaders. Second, I think the report uniquely provides a framework for identifying top factors that will shape the globe and the Great Commission between now and 2050. Now, this framework really allows the global leaders to not only see the top trends, but also find and identify the deeper currents that are actually underneath these trends. And lastly, I think the report really draws heavily on the voice of the global church. From the global listening calls that led up to this report, to teams of scholars identifying the issues, to a 150-person author, polycentric writing team, an editorial team, this is really the global voice. And by having this global voice, we can really begin to see and find appropriate analyst analysis uh, of these global issues. So really, my hope is at the end, this does not supersede or replace, but actually begins to augment our understanding uh, in this way for everybody. It's a marker in time, and it will remain this kind of continual effort of research as we go. It's never static. So Dr. Nieman, this whole process of putting together the State of the Great Commission report, it's a mammoth task. And I, I'm sure that you spent a lot of time doing research and, and checking to see whether you were on the right track. Were there any moments in your experience of putting this whole report together that you just knew, I am on the right track, we're doing the right thing, and we're answering the right question? Yeah, the Lord has been faithful. There have been several moments that were just very clear on the collaborative collaboration that what we were doing uh, was aligning with the global voice. As we produced our draft of the 10 questions and 40 topics, we had the opportunity to talk with other people around the world as, world as we did uh, on frequent basis. And in several instances, we would show the draft and they would affirm on every continent and every region. But there were a couple instances where we hadn't shown the draft yet. And people were reporting to us, we just had this meeting of the top leaders and we established our own key points from now to 2050. And they would share the list with me. And it would be 90, 95% exactly what we had on two to three different occasions. And maybe the most powerful moment, there are two to three major documents being written for L4 and Seoul. One of them is say the Great Commission Report. The other one is a Seoul statement, a theological statement. And we had been working separately on our particular reports and came together for the first time. And, and had mentioned, hey, we have these top questions that, we're, that we have as draft form. And I said, but there are a couple, I think, that are really important for our age that's there. And then the Soul Statement Theology Group came and we're saying, yeah, we have four reports within this and we've got two particular issues we think are important. And, and Jason, those lined up one-to-one -one from the theology side and wow. the strategy side without even talking the top two questions uh, from 
a polycentric group on both sides, mm. theologians and missiologists on both sides came and said, yes, these are the key questions for our age. Deeply confirmatory. The thing that I found so inspiring about this whole process that you've gone through is just how collaborative it has become. I would love to give you an opportunity just to share with our listeners the processes and the methodologies that were employed to gather the data and the insights for this report. Can you tell us who participated in the creation of this report and how you went about putting it all together? Yeah, certainly. As I mentioned before, this has been a multi-year process. It first started with listening calls that Lausanne hosted in every region and every issue around the globe. Hundreds of people spoke into that process, provided answers to key questions are, what are the greatest gaps in the Great Commission? What are the greatest opportunities? And who do we need to listen to more these kind of critical questions. From that, we gathered the data and we had a great listening team that produced a, an analytical report of that. And that really served as a foundation for the State of the Great Commission report. Taking from that, we then gathered a group, of, a small group of scholars globally to do a six month literature review. We began to read so widely. We read everything from CIA reports to World Bank reports to UN, all the way to Christian reports and Christian encyclopedias both Christian and secular, to get a sense of where is this world and what are the major issues that are happening and framing our world right now. We took up that wide scope and we condensed it and collated it down to these 10 questions that are there. From that, we began to identify not only these 10 questions, but the 40 topics that begin to shape our world. Uh, and we identified key thinkers and key leaders around the world who've been providing great witness to these questions in the Christian church. So each report has anywhere from three to five authors from around the world on this that have collaborated to co-author a particular report. In that, we have 150 some odd authors within this. Of course, then we go through this large editing process with a wonderful editorial team and translation process. And as you can imagine, we're not completely finished yet, but we are well along our way in this multi-year process and we're excited for the outcome. That's wonderful. I think that the thing that I find so compelling about this report is that it's the global church reporting on the global state of mission, which I think is so unique to anything that we have seen before. I would love to ask you, the report is stated as the state of the Great Commission mm -hmm. report. So how are we doing? What is our current situation? What does, what does some of your, your data reveal? Yeah, the, the report really has several different sections. We begin the report with a wonderful theological introduction on what is the Great Commission. Lausanne's theological working group has put that together for us. Then we move into, as we're talking about now, the current state of the Great Commission. Part two begins to look at trends and questions that will shape between now and 2050. And then we end with regional considerations. But if we're beginning to discuss where are we now in the current state of the Great Commission, uh, there's a, a vast array of observations to be made. But maybe I'll just make a couple here uh, for sake of time. We can begin to observe that approximately 34% of the world identifies as Christian. How Christianity looks has dynamically changed in the last 100, 150 years. In 1900, much of the global population was located in Europe and North America, but now the majority of global Christianity resides in Africa, Asia, Latin America. Maybe to put it in a few different words, in 1900, as I often say, the average Christian was best represented by a European male. And now the average Christian globally is probably best represented by a Nigerian female. So our global church, we have to recognize, is really a polycentric church with dynamic cores of faith existing in multiple spots around the globe, which is why we're pleased to have the report be a polycentric effort within that. And as we looked at other parts of the Great Commission efforts currently, it's really exciting and encourages to see there's really ex exponential growth in a lot of mission efforts in the areas of Bible translation on every region, Bible translations have skyrocketed, church planting movements, disciple making movements have become exponential. And really, we can praise the Lord for this. It's really encouraging. But however, perhaps the most difficult observation of the current status is if you zoom all the way out and you look at the trend line of global Christianity between 1900 and projected 2050, basically the line is flat. Global Christianity has remained approximately 33 to 35% of the globe for 150 years. Now, granted, wow. as we observe that, Christianity has looked very different, as we just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And really, we can celebrate keeping up with population growth. As population boomed, we've kept up with growth. But fundamentally, as we zoom out, the proverbial needle really hasn't moved for 150 years. 
And that's a really hard truth that we have to wrestle with. Dr. Newman, why don't we jump into the second section of the State of the Great Commission report? You framed it from, 20, from today to 2050. And in that section, you pose 10 questions that are connected to global shifts. Could you take a moment just to highlight a couple that you find especially compelling? Yeah, I think to start, we have to recognize and be thankful that the gospel never changes. As I sift through so much of our shifting world, I continually come back and thank God every day that his gospel never shifts. But we also have to recognize that our world does shift and it's shifting very dramatically at this point in time. So really looking at global shifts is beginning to recognize that the world's changing and therefore how people hear and receive the gospel also changes. So we began to look and identify what are the major shifts that are, that are happening globally. And we, we, as you mentioned, Jason, we've got 10 questions that are really shaping the world between now and 2050 with about 40 trends underneath those 10 questions. But if we begin to look at really where are the big questions for our age, I believe there's two big questions if we had to select of the 10 that are really shifting our world. And the first question that's really shifted almost all parts of our lives for the majority of the world is what is a digital age? You know, we've really become accustomed to this in our time, but if you zoom out, we live fundamentally at a different time than even when Lausanne held its last Congress in 2010. Since 2010, the amount of digital participation and data collection and scope of digital devices has just exponentially exploded. We are really only about 10 to 15 to 20 years into this widespread digital revolution. And in many ways, we're still trying to figure out what all this means. So as this digital revolution has grown in new areas such as AI and biotech, really this question has massive implications for our world and fundamentally how the church engages the world, how the church engages in its forms, Bible engagement, proclamation of evangelism, how does that all happen in a digital age? But that really leads me to the second question and what I often say, I believe this question is the fundamental question of our age. The question is, what does it mean to be human? And so much of our world now is really questioning the definition of humans. From technological developments yeah. to gender and sexual identity shifts to mental health, really every angle is rethinking and questioning, questioning even what does it mean and how do we define human? Right? In other words, and maybe in theological terms, uh, these developments are really calling into question the image of God and man, the necessity of God for redemption of sins and scars, the availability of eternal life apart from God, the purpose of man. Mm -hmm. It is deep. It is fundamental, Jason. And the question of what does it mean to be human really is shaping and will continue to affect the gospel message around the world between now and 2050. Yeah, uh, I mean, as I worked with um, the next gen, I, that is essentially the the question that they're all coming to the table and they're asking. It's everything that they're exposed to on social media. It's e everything they they watch on TV, and so it would be fascinating to unpack that through your reports. Mm -hmm. you, you've already mentioned how we've gone through this process of listening, and that led you to unpacking these ten questions. And I think it's so fascinating that you frame this report using questions rather than predictions or data. I would love to hear, could you unpack for us how you came to determining those 10 questions and why you chose to use questions rather than relying on data and predictions? Yeah, perhaps, perhaps uniquely, these 10 questions were derived from an equal look at what is shaping our world and what is shaping the church. You know, mm. all, all too often, perhaps we often look in a narrow scope on what is shaping the church and what is the church efforts and, you know, what is happening in our global mission efforts. And that's defining the state of the Great Commission. But our team particularly and distinctively took, and I took the notion that our world is shifts and we have to contextualize and contextualization is an ever going, ongoing process. So we just as much have to look at the world as we do our current efforts, because in the future, the world will be changing and thus hopefully our, current, our efforts will change as well. So as I mentioned before, we, one day we were reading CIA reports and World Bank reports and the other we were reading World Handbook of Christianity. The next day we were re watching Davos Economic Forum, the next day reading Vatican reports on, on what's happening. So uh, this is the 10 questions are a unique blend of what is happening in our world and what is happening in the church. And so it, as we began to look at these current trends, we were able to identify pretty easily a top list of trends that were shaping our world. But this is the hard part when you start looking into the future. 
Do you make predictions? Do you let the data extrapolate out and make a call from there? But there really, there's this dichotomy between what is certain and what's not really certain. But as many people and many scholars have said, as you look into the future, you may not actually know where it's going, but what will shape the future is already on the desks of the leaders today. So I'm quite confident that what is going to shape 2050 is already being formed in universities and publishing houses and boardrooms and then on the desktops of the leaders and influencers mm -hmm. today. So in that, we could be pretty certain on what are the topics and the questions being asked and shaped now. But I'm really uncertain about any specific advances or events that will be catalytic in shapers of our future world. As we've seen in all of our lifetimes, things are unexpected that will come and shape it in ways we didn't predict. So we really avoided wild futuristic predictions or even boldly predicting or softly predicting where the world is going, technological advances, rumors of future wars, social developments, fall and rise of church forms. We didn't go there. And we chose to frame it as questions because we're quite certain that these are the questions that are shaping mm -hmm. our world. And the church needs to be a part of that, those questions shaping as well. So in short, we, we can know the questions and we just don't know the answers yet. And what I love about framing the report with questions is I can imagine a pastor going to his church and leading a conversation, stopping and saying, hey, what does it actually mean to be human? And conversations being formed within that community, discussing that. And then he now has the ability to look at what does the data set? What do the um, leading you know, writers and you know, people who have given information and written articles for the report, what would have they had to say into these questions? And so I just find that it's such a helpful resource to the global church to be able to frame good questions to their people and be able to say, what does God say? And, and have really great conversations. What kind of conversations do you hope that this report will initiate within the global Christian community? Yeah, this is one of my biggest hopes, perhaps, for the report. All too often, the church isn't fully engaged in the questions or the conversations that's shaping our world. And so by not predicting where it's going so the church can plot a line to attend to the end, which at that point is often too late or the trend has already taken effect, uh, by shaping questions, I really hope the conversation has become about how do we enter into that conversation and how do we influence for Christ the outcome of those questions? And so these are deep questions and questions that need a lot of serious thought, but really the report is advocating then for this careful study of culture, finding contextualized actions, but not making hard plans since we don't know the future, but loosely making our plans to still allow for the movement of spirit, right? And this way we can be prepared contextually to share the good news of the gospel really in this dynamic shifting world. So ultimately I hope that the church recognizes that these key questions are shaping our future and we need to stop being reactionary and become proactive in the shaping of the world for Christ. So the State of the Great Commission report has a third section to it, which is got to do with regional considerations. Re it has a regional focus. Why is it important to consider the State of the Great Commission from a regional perspective as opposed to just one global report? Yeah, certainly. I'll be the first to say that global trends are very helpful, but they are not the end-all be-all. No one actually lives globally. We all live locally. Mm -hmm. Certainly, we need to know the global trends so we can see and understand the deeper currents of our world. But when I get up and I go to work, I do that in a certain location. So each of these global trends kind of manifest themselves differently in various cultures. So as we move from this broad understanding, when we move regionally, we're beginning to look at specific action. We begin to see and explore how does the regional, country, city, even subculture level play out. Right? And it's, this is really where the contextualization of the gospel message occurs. So it's important to understand this level. So again, the global trends allow us to see the broad strokes, but really there are regional realities that are just as dynamic as the global trends, but just for that region. So not only can we see how the global trends are playing themselves out on the local level, we can, the regional reports also allow us to see the dynamics of a region, particular to that region. So for example, right, militant Hinduism is currently playing a major role in shaping South Asia. But that's not necessarily the case in Latin America or other global regions. 
So this is an opportunity in the regional report for South Asia to identify their, or other regions to identify their key regional trends and inform the world. So these regional reports allow us to zoom in on the contextual base, but also allow the regions to inform the world on what's happening in their region. And how do you envision the report being utilized across all the different regions? Yeah, we, one of the more prideful points, if you will, on the preparation of the report is we've gone to great lengths uh, for the vast majority of the report and data to report everything on a regional level, not just a global level. So in every page, we're showing the global trend, but we're showing how this breaks down in every region. So early, we're, we hope that a person, as they read the report or views the graphics, can really get a sense of the global reality and understand the dynamics in their own region. So for example, when we look at the dynamics, let's say, of growth of secularism in the report, we can see the deep impact it's making on the globe in general. But yet, I hope that a reader from North America can see that secularism is making a different kind of impact and emerging from a different set of dynamics that a reader might see from East Asia. Ultimately, this report provides these broad global trends, but we hope and pray it provides enough detail for each region so that readers can become interested or learn more and seek out more specific regional data. Thank you, Dr. Newman, just for framing that report for us. And we're going to dive into how we as listeners can engage with the report as we head into the future. But before we go there, I would like to take a step back for a moment and go back to the start of our conversation yes. where we spoke about your interdisciplinary background and um, having um, a passion for architecture and a passion for mission and church and theology. And having seen the drafts of the report is not simply just pages of writing or pages of data, but heavily utilizes graphic visualizations. Could you share with us how your interdisciplinary background has influenced the shaping of this report? Yeah. I often joke, Jason, when people see the report for the first time, they're quite surprised. I mean, Lausanne has done a wonderful job of producing global documents and written works over the years. But when they see this report, their eyes open a bit as they see page after page after tens and tens, a hundred pages of graphics. Uh, they're, we're excited that the, I joke that that's what happens when you hire a designer to, to trick to say the Great Commission Report. But I do hope that say the Great Commission Report really augments this tradition now visually. As I mentioned, the report's going to offer over a hundred pages of graphics to represent this data. Uh, and really, this is an intentional move and an intentional approach. And this is coming from a couple different motivations. First, we recognize that we live in a visual age. We're used to reading things visually and often give more merit to visual communication or think things are more true if they're produced better. So we recognize this and we attempt to make the report format align with our times. But secondly, really, it's a desire to attend to the visual directly draws from this interdisciplinary background, as you mentioned, Jason. My academic background is varied, which is just as much apologetics and theology and missiology as a design and design research. So as a, I currently serve as the Associate Dean of the College of Architecture, Visual Arts and Design at Cal Baptist University in California, which is the largest Protestant college of art and design in the United States. And so as we were making this report, I often had my students in mind, this next generation of mine, if I handed them this report, would they be interested enough? Would it align with how they see the world visually and would they be able to draw from it, use it as a tool? So we, we applied a lot of what we do here at the College of Art and Design and put it into the reports for these different motivations. Thank you for that, Dr. Newman. As someone who's seen the drafts of the reports, I can testify that it is a beautiful report and um, it just invites you to continue to read on and to engage with the data. So well done to you and your team for the excellent work that you have done in putting this report together. I'm sure that we have had some listeners who are hearing everything you've had to say about this report and they're wondering, how can I get my hands <laughs> on the state of the Great Commission report? And so could you just share with our listeners a bit of the next steps in terms of how the report is going to be released and how they can engage with yeah. it? Brothers and sisters around the world, it's coming. Don't worry. It'll be, for those of you attending Seoul uh, in 2024, it'll start becoming released bit by bit through the pre-program training that, that's coming to you. Uh, we'll be releasing it on the web and it'll be available for free for a full PDF download as it comes to the to full fruition. Right now we're in translation processes and continuing to draft some of the final report yeah. in the great report. Uh, so it's coming. Fear not. It'll be here. Awesome. And based on the report's findings, what immediate actions 
would you recommend for both the global and regional church? How can individuals and churches and organizations engage with the report's conclusions? Yeah. As I recall before, the, one of the motivations in taking this role is those moments when I looked up, God came beside me and allowed me to, to work a little bit more strategically, not just a head down, crank to the email for the day. So every leader in every organization, I encourage you to look up. Take an intentional break from the day-to-day, -day, head down operations, and recognize that the world is dynamically shifting. So in that, I would encourage leaders and organizations to organize a retreat and evaluate whether their efforts are attending to the short-term factors or understanding and attending to the deeper currents. Evaluate whether you are actively participating in the questions that will shape our world. It is, and I get the privilege in my position to speak on the great State of the Great Commission around the world. Oftentimes during these sessions, I present 10 questions and the 40 trends as discussed. Uh, but after the presentation, I poll the audience and ask, which of these 10 questions do you believe are gonna most shape the world? And then I ask, which of these 10 questions do you think the church is doing really well at and attending to? And I ask a third question, which of the 10 questions is the church least prepared to attend to? So Jason, every session, no matter where I am in the globe, the results are the same. The questions the church is attending to are not the questions that will most shape the world. And even more, every time at every poll, participants recognize that the questions that are shaping the world most are the exact questions that they believe the church is least prepared to participate in. So really, it's really imperative that every leader and organization takes a moment and looks up, takes this intentional effort and build and begins to attend to our dynamic world. So I really hope that the State of the Great Commission Report can serve as this important tool in this process of seeking God's will and understanding our world. Wow, thank you for that, Dr. Niema. It's a real challenge. And what I'll do is I'll put those 10 questions in the show notes so that everyone who is listening to this can ask those very same questions for themselves. As we bring this conversation to a close, how can people find you? Yeah. I work for several different organizations, so you can find me in a lot of different ways. Um, certainly through the Lausanne Movement website or LinkedIn or California Baptist University website. Or if you just want to go directly to it, uh, more information on me and what's going on can be found at matthewnearman.com. Thank you. And I would encourage everyone to go and take a look at your website. It's beautiful integration of mission and architecture. So it's worth just going through and taking a look at Matthew Newman's website. As we bring this conversation to a close, a question I've been asking everyone on the podcast as we, we close each interview is, what is your hope and your prayer for the Seoul 2024 gathering? Yeah. I really pray that Seoul 2024 can be a catalytic starting point to accelerate global mission and primarily accelerating by identifying these gaps of the Great Commission and working as a polycentric church to organize the strategic collaborative action to attend to those gaps. That's so good. And with those closing words, I wanna thank you, Dr. Nieman, for your time. Thank you for all the effort you've been putting into this report. And I'm trusting and I'm praying that this report will be a blessing to the global church. Thank you. Thanks, Jason.